So welcome to um, this uh, workshop session on developing embedded applications in Rust. Uh, my name is Ulf and I um, uh, work for Red Hat uh, on the Drogue IoT project. Uh, that project is about uh, creating a connectivity later, layer for IoT devices that support ingress of different events for HTTP, MQTT, CoAP, or for a lower one network. Uh, but it also uh, has a device side, uh, which is a framework for writing a microcontroller firmware. And this is what we are doing in Rust. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't uh, have this workshop in person in Brno because I was imagining we'd all have these boards that we were playing with. Um, so I tried to restructure it a bit so that uh, you can follow it without uh, having the hardware uh, yourself. Um, you might need to install a Rust tool chain and, and uh, things in order to compile. So you can, if you go to the session page uh, on the on the shed dot com, then uh, you can find some of the links to the Git repositories and stuff there if you wanna follow. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start a bit about why we're uh, actually doing Rust for embedded in the first place. Um, because that's, you know, there's a lot of uh, existing things written in C um, and then also see what, what would actually Rust uh, help you with. And then we're going to uh, sort of go through uh, these Rust applications uh, layer by layer, uh, starting with uh, like directly accessing the hardware, then uh, sort of seeing what abstractions that you, you, you can use in order to uh, make your software, you know, Better, better and uh, also more efficient. Uh, and we'll end up with uh, some application that actually talks to uh, the cloud. And uh, I'll try to do most of these uh, live, but uh, I, might, I have uh, some recordings in in, the, in case there's a, a demo monster is showing up. Um, so yeah, let's uh, start. Uh, first, what do I mean by embedded? Because some people, mean different things about embedded than me. And uh, I, you know, people think that maybe a tiny device with uh, four gigabytes of RAM is a embedded device running Linux. But uh, in this case, it's um, a very tiny microcontrollers that only have uh, kilobytes of RAM. They uh, only have uh, a kilobytes, maybe a megabyte or two of flash for the uh, program itself. And then there's no operating system around to help you run the software. Um, and there's also no, usually no memory allocator, although you can supply your own, of course, but uh, it's very bare metal as a, we call it. Um, and what what is Rust? Uh, well, it's a programming language which uh, has kind of found its niche in uh, software where you need uh, full control over your memory and also execution time. Uh, this is typically maybe operating systems, uh, language runtimes or embedded. Um, but it started out uh, as uh, a browser engine project. So um, it focuses on re performance, of course, then, and uh, also being reliable. It has a lot of uh, compile time mechanisms for catching a lot of programming mistakes that you simply cannot catch in uh, other languages at compile time. If you're unless you're using some static analyzer, for instance. Um, and also trying to be, still be productive, like not not uh, not very hard to use. But in my personal opinion, it's, the, it's might be a hard initial uh, learning curve to Rust. But uh, I think once you uh, get familiar with the language, you're starting to see uh, uh, productivity so um, but uh, what's wrong with C right we uh, we've been using that for a, a long time uh, everybody writes applications in C uh, there's a lot of real-time operating systems and SDKs from all the hardware vendors uh, in, written in C so it's a very hard uh, tough decision actually to sort of say, oh no, we're going to write this in Rust instead. Uh, this new thing that we don't know if people are using. Um, 
but uh, there are a lot of companies using it and uh, many people have uh, rust uh, code in production so it's not uh, that new uh, but let's start with the problems with C. Um, let's try and sort of see why, what can Rust offer? Uh, so we'll take a simple C code example here, um, uh, describing the issue of data races. Um, and this is a common source in embedded, uh, especially when you have these interrupts coming from all the peripherals of your hardware. And then uh, you don't really have a good way to ensure that you're not accidentally writing and reading from the same data uh, from two different contexts. So you might have some application that reads a counter in one thread or it uh, during the idle uh, run uh, loop. And then uh, you get an interrupt from your peripheral and then that modifies the counter and then you don't really know if you have a consistent value. Um, so, you know, this, this example is all using a single global variable and you know that's generally a bad practice of course, but that's often usually the way things are done in embedded C because you want to have a predictable footprint and know uh, what, how much memory you're actually consuming at the compile time. But it only gets more complicated once you have, uh, start having multiple interrupts at multiple priorities and so on, so. And uh, another problem with C is this tooling. Uh, there's not really a single build tool or a dependency manager. You have projects using Make, someone using CMake, then you have something called West for Zephyr, and Python, and Newt, and so you know, we end up using a different uh, dependency and build tool depending on uh, what um, what project you're using. So as we're Everyone who's been programming higher level languages like, you know, Java, Go or JavaScript, they know that we need some some dependency manager in order to manage your uh, dependencies and uh, ensuring that, well, it makes it easier to get be productive, really. Um, so <clears throat> can we do better? So by the way, this this gnome that I keep putting on my slides, this is kind of our, uh, let's say, mascot. Uh, so you can sort of imagine he's, he's saying these things, right? Uh, okay, so let's take a look at what the, the, the same example looks like in Rust. Uh, you have a global counter, uh, you have something reading it and something modifying it. And you this might be your first into the uh, first, uh, seeing Rust syntax, but uh, it, it should not hopefully, should hopefully not be too different from C, but uh, you have a, a, counter, a global variable which you denote using the static keyword, and then you say that it's mutable using the mut keyword. And then when then you're, you can notice that whenever you're accessing it, you're actually wrapping the your code in an unsafe block and this is because if you didn't do that, then the, the comp compiler would not compile your program. Uh, it would see that hey, you're accessing a global mutable variable uh, from two, this, two different functions. We, we can't really know if this is, this is not thread safe, you know, uh, because an integer is not thread safe. Uh, so that's why you have to use unsafe. So, uh, so your program can work, but you in this case, it won't work more than a C, the C version. It's just that you're sort of saying, I can shoot myself in the foot. So the, the proper way to do this <coughs> would be to have maybe some uh, synchronization types. Uh, and you can see how pretty that is, having this uh, <laughs> types named mutex, wrapping a cell, wrapping a integer. It's not that pretty either, but it's actually safe and uh, and the compiler will allow it. Um, but uh, you probably want to do something like atomics in this case, uh, which has uh, type signatures that mm, makes the compiler allow you to use it without an unsafe block, the same way as the, uh, the mutex uh, that I just showing. So embedded Rust, 
Um, let's talk. Let's talk a bit about uh, uh, how this is done. So in Rust, you have something called the standard library, uh, and with the standard library, you have uh, the heap where you can do dynamic memory allocation. You have collections, all the usual collections people know about. Um, you have uh, basically a lot of uh, language framework for, for doing stuff, uh, which you already have in all the other languages, right? But when you're running on a microcontroller, you, you can't really use this because it would it consume too much memory and, uh, and flash. Uh, so you have a mode called the no STD, which means you are not able to access the standard library. Um, um, there are uh, replacements for the standard collections that where you declare yours, uh, you know, how many items you're going to put in your vector before your uh, program runs. Uh, so that, that's fine, but also then you can sort of waste space. Um, but that, that mode is really ideal for uh, writing firmware uh, kernels or uh, bootloader code where uh, you want a minimal footprint. Uh, and more for microcontrollers, of course, uh, which is the, the whole point of this workshop, really. Uh, and then in Rust, you have a single dependency tool called uh, Cargo. And uh, Cargo is really great because uh, it can it allows you to uh, just specify the versions of your dependencies and it will pull them from uh, the central repository called crates.io. Um, and you can also point it to just your file system or, uh, uh, or uh, GitHub directly. So it's very flexible in this, this way. And We'll, we will see how, how this works, but you have a manifest which describes your software, your firmware, um, and then you declare everything it needs in order to build. And uh, this, this tool can be used to compile your software for just your PC uh, and cross-compile to any embedded target architecture as well. So it's really nice not having to jump between uh, modes the Rust uh, ecosystem uh, in the community is uh, built around a layered approach where you have, you start with a microcontroller on the, on the bottom uh, and you can sort of, your software can access the hardware directly if you want to, but um, for most microcontrollers, there is a peripheral access crate uh, and this <coughs> provides the register definitions for how to access the different devices on your microcontroller, like the SPI bus, I2C bus or uh, uh, CPU registers that you need to, to access. Um, and the use of, when you're using the peripheral access crate, that's usually unsafe code because it doesn't guarantee that only one can access the registers at the same, um, oh, sorry, uh, access uh, devices in the same, in a, in a safe way. <laughs> Let's say you can have a, maybe there's some uh, higher level restrictions that you can't write to one register while doing this other thing. Uh, and that's usually enforced at the layer above, which is called a hardware abstraction, abstraction layer implementation. Uh, and this is where you have uh, maybe an SBI type or uh, uh, a, a sensor or, or whatever um, that uh, works across multiple uh, variants of a microcontroller. Like for SDM32, they have like uh, probably several hundreds variants. So ha having to sort of modify your code whenever you want to change it to work on one or the other would be really painful. But the nice thing is that it, it prevents you from doing stupid things uh, with your microcontroller. Um, and then if you want to write drivers uh, for a particular temperature sensor or uh, accelerometer or whatever, then you typically want it to work with all these different uh, SBI buses that exist in the world. So that's why there's a hardware extraction layer trait uh, or API, as it's typically known in other languages, where um, which defines a common behavior of all SBI peripherals. Uh, so when you're writing your driver, you're using those APIs uh, as a base and then it will work on any microcontroller. And on the top is your application. So enough talk, let's uh, get to the uh, uh, workshop or demo itself. 
Um, the hardware um, I'll be using is uh, a development kit from STM32. Uh, let's see if you can see it. This is what it looks like in the real life. Um, the reason uh, I chose this one is basically because it has uh, a Wi-Fi uh, uh, chip on board, which we'll use, but it also has Bluetooth uh, radio and uh, a lot of sensors, like uh, I think it even has a gyroscope and uh, uh, accelerometer, um, humidity sensor, temperature sensor, uh, and we'll use the temperature sensor, and then uh, a few buttons. So. Um, Kind of, you can use it to play around with uh, <clears throat> embedded stuff. Um, yeah, so, and um, we're going to use it with our uh, draw, uh, our cloud instance eventually, but uh, we'll start off with just a hello world, because that's uh, uh, sort of, you have to do that. So we'll, um, look at that basic uh, REST project. Uh, you'll notice there is uh, two files there. One is the cargo tumble file and a cargo log file. So the cargo tumble file is the manifest or our project. There's these uh, very commonly known uh, things like uh, the metadata about your uh, software, the name of your package, its version, and the addition, which points to a specific addition of Rust, the Rust language uh, that this package will work with. Um, then you have a list of dependencies. In our case, uh, this is uh, dependencies that allow you to access the microcontroller registers itself. Um, the RT stands for runtime, which is basically a very thin uh, shim that sets up some of the very common registers on, on that applies to all of the Cortex M uh, microcontrollers for uh, running your application. So we don't really want to do anything different there usually. And then um, there's a peripheral access crate for our particular board. Um, and you can see here, I have some more information because you can, in Rust, you can have compile time features for your library so that when you're building your project, uh, you can uh, skip features you don't want uh, and enable features you want, which allows, uh, for instance, a library to, to support things that work with the standard library and a subset of that that only works for embedded, for instance. And then uh, there's a few libraries for uh, doing logging. This is commonly used because it's a very uh, efficient logging uh, implementation that uh, doesn't actually transfer the whole log string across the debug probe. Then there's um, uh, a, a panic behavior. If your program crashes, then it actually prints the, uh, the uh, backtrace across the debug uh, debugger. So that's uh, useful. Um, the cargo log file is basically a sort of a manifestation of your dependencies and their dependencies. So it keeps a full track of the whole um, uh, list of dependencies that you need to, to build your application. So this is useful if you want to audit uh, your dependencies and track licenses and stuff like that. Uh, before we look into the application, there's also um, another file we want to look at, which is a bit special for embedded. Um, basically, it defines a few things like uh, uh, some flags to the compiler. Um, you don't really need to know what these are doing, but it, it basically uh, provides some linker scripts uh, so that uh, it works correctly on uh, the Cortex M platforms. And then the target uh, build architecture is specified here so that the car, the Cargo, the, the build tool, will know which uh, microcontroller to compile your code for. Um, the build tool also has a way to run your application. So if you just do cargo run, you can run uh, an application on your PC. Uh, for embedded, you want to actually run it on your microcontroller. So that's why you have a tool called probe run mentioned here. 
and specifying actually which microcontroller it's using. So we can actually run our embedded application like uh, any other application. Uh, so let's run it. Um, So uh, this first flag uh, environment variable I'm setting here enables uh, logging at the uh, info level. The logging is enabled at compile time because doing it at runtime is, you know, it comes with a cost of extra code. Uh, and then dash dash release is just to produce more compact code, really. And then uh, we run your applica our application and it prints a little world. <laughs> um, Okay, so that's uh, the first step. Uh, let's go back to uh, slides. So, um, just mentioning that if you're following, if you're trying to re do these steps, uh, the when you have the if you have the Rust installed using the Rust up tool, then uh, once you have that. It, that you don't need to do anything else uh, other than uh, maybe installing this uh, uh, tool to run it if you have a uh, if you have this board yourself. Okay, so um, so let's do some more uh, something more exciting. Let's blink an LED by pressing a button. It's like super advanced stuff. Uh, and um, uh, on this board, we have a, a blue button that we can uh, press. Um, and it will light an LED, uh, yeah, where I'm having it on the slide. And then um, we'll see how we can build an application from the ground up doing that, and then see these different layers that I talked about earlier. So we'll start at the uh, the, the peripheral access crate. So we'll, we'll see how an application looks like for that. Um, so let's look at the manifest first. In this case, uh, and it's almost the same dependency. It's like the hello world. I'm using a different peripheral access crate that uh, um, the, the, our team is sort of contributing to. Um, this allows you to select which microcontroller you want to use at compile time, um, which is uh, really nice because there's so many variants of them. So there's uh, not a lot of difference there. Um, our uh, application, though, is uh, quite different. Um, so first, just you'll see is uh, we have a declaration at the top, which is the um, uh, marker that this is a, an application that's not using the standard library. Uh, so the compiler will not will sort of fail if you're trying to use the standard library. Then you also have uh, some of the debug uh, debug logic being imported. And then finally, you have this uh, peripheral access crate imported. So these are just import declarations. Your application starts in your main entry point, which you will annotate with uh, uh, this uh, macro, as it's called. And it basically does it uh, sets up the uh, the the microcontroller uh, interrupt vectors and, and uh, launches into your uh, main application. So uh, yeah, to blink an LED using the peripheral access crate, uh, that's pretty uh, hard. <laughs> uh, first, you need to enable the, the clock uh, on your uh, board, which you can do like this. And you can see we have to use unsafe code. Uh, we have to modify some registers, enable the various GPIO ports. So it's it's not it's not trivial. Then you need to uh, uh, set up your uh, the button so that it can actually uh, uh, intercept these uh, signals when you're pressing it. 
that's also not that very easy. You have uh, you have to sort of say which which button it is. Uh, you have some more unsafe code to modify registers. Don't worry if you don't understand this this code. It's not this. That's not uh, really important. It's just to show that this is really a uh, lot of code that's hard to read. <laughs> um, finally, we need to set up the LED as well. So uh, yeah, this uh, just all of this. You can, uh, if you look at the reference manual for your microcontroller, that's when you see which register you need to see it set and which value. And then we have the REST API that helps us ensuring which values we can actually set. So there's some usefulness to the peripheral access criteria in that it prevents us from setting invalid values to the registers. And that's good. Um, and then our main loop is basically the pin of your button, uh, and if it's pressed, then uh, uh, light the LED, and if not, you uh, do not light the LED. <laughs> That's it, it, just 70 lines of code to, <laughs> to uh, blink an LED. And uh, we can try and run this and uh, see if it works in, the, in life. Okay, so now it's running on my uh, chip, and I will uh, press the button. And you can see the LED, there's a green LED there oh, and with my finger where it's blinking. Okay. That's uh, the, using the peripheral access crate. And uh, uh, let's see where I was there. So oh, uh, what we should take a look at now is how would you do this at the peripheral access crate, uh, no, at the hardware abstraction, abstraction layer. Um, and that's a lot better. Um, let's take a look at the manifest first. Um, now instead of the meta pack, we are now importing the HAL from Embassy, which is this project that uh, we're uh, uh, using in Drogue. Um, and this is uh, a runtime, but also a, 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 a HAL for um, accessing the hardware. And uh, we'll see how much simpler this is. It's, uh, this is the entire application. So we're importing these types from the HAL that uh, specify what an input pin and output pin and what these things are. Uh, and our main application is basically just saying to the hardware abstraction layer, initialize my microcontroller. Um, and then you can use these higher level types uh, to say that my LED is an output using this particular uh, port uh, and starts at uh, high. Uh, and then the button is an input at this particular port these port definitions are part of uh, the user manual of the board. So this will vary depending on which board you're, board you're using. And then there's a the main loop, which is just looping, checking if the button is pressed. If it is, then enable, set the light up the LED. Uh, if not, uh, turn it off. So as you can see, this, uh, this is a lot simpler uh, and more understandable application, even if you don't really know Rust that well. You can sort of get a feel for what it's doing, I think. Um, so let's try and run it, if it actually works. It does. Oops. I hit the cable. Okay, so um, that's um, that's the HAL. But there, there's one problem with it, uh, and that's that uh, the application is continuously uh, busy looping, uh, checking for the state of the button, and that's not very power efficient. Um, so we want to do uh, more low power stuff um, uh, and um, 
the way to do that typically is using interrupts. So let's look, uh, take a look at an example where you're actually doing that first. Uh, and then see where we go from there. Uh, the dependencies are essentially the same, so I won't really with that. Um, let's look at the application. Now you can see uh, this is a lot more uh, complex. <coughs> you have to, you can initial, initialize the HAL and you initialize your buttons as before and the LED, but now you have to think about a bit differently because you need these types to be accessible by your interrupt handler, which is declared down here. And then the interrupt handler needs to check the state of the button and then enable or disable the LED. Um, so, uh, and the main application needs to, when it's created the LED and button, it needs to enable interrupt for the button so that you get a trigger when uh, it's pushed. And then it also needs to set these global variables that reference the button and the LED. And uh, this, if you saw this earlier in the slides, which is, it's pretty ugly in my opinion, where you have to declare all these types and, uh, you know, have these complex type signatures for everything. Then it, uh, your main loop is basically just uh, sleeping uh, all the time. And then the interrupt handler is the one that's actually uh, uh, lighting up uh, the buttons and so on. Uh, so that's, that's that. Um, but we need to test it and see if it runs. It runs, I think. So, still blinking. So, uh, you know, that's, so now we're using low, low power, uh, that's nice, but uh, it's not really nice for, um, the power, uh, and I know it's not really nice uh, code to maintain. So uh, what we need to do is, sorry. We, what we can do with this is to use some frameworks, of course, that uh, deal with this ugliness for us. There is a project called Arctic, which is, uh, uh, let's say a task scheduler for Rust. There's a project called, uh, uh, Talk, that is an RTOS, real-time operating system, uh, and also one called Hubris. These have some advantages in, in that they uh, um, they solve a lot of the uh, uh, low-level access for you. But also one of the great things about Rust, in my opinion, is that all of these libraries that I uh, can use on um, the shared repository, you can sort of mix and match exactly what you need for your application very easily. You don't have this in the C world. So that's why I think you end up with all of these real-time operating systems and projects that sort of solve everything. Whereas in Rust, you can sort of, you know, pick and play, uh, pick exactly what uh, you want and compose your application that way. Uh, the thing we'll be using here is something, a project called Embassy, which is a project uh, uh, my, uh, my team and, uh, and I have been uh, contributing uh, to to bring it up to speed, but it was initially made by uh, someone who actually uh, run it on the, their uh, production uh, firmwares. And um, Embassy is basically this HAL that we've seen that abstracts the hardware, but it's also a, a runtime. Um, and it's actually an async runtime. So, and uh, async is really uh, a, a unique language feature of Rust, in, especially in terms of embedded, uh, because <clears throat> uh, people who are familiar with, uh, you know, futures and promises and async in higher, lang higher level languages, often think they are nice because you, you avoid this callback hell or, uh, or these event, complex event loops. And uh, Rust has the same thing, but in Rust, uh, they are actually, uh, let's say, zero cost. They don't, need uh, uh, an allocator to work. And uh, Embassy uh, is actually a runtime that allows you to run these asynchronous tasks um, continuously. Uh, so just 
quickly explaining what 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 how this works is that you have uh, an executor which runs these uh, tasks and you have a, a set of tasks in your firmware and then what the executor does is just check with each task is do you, can you make progress if you can then it will try to try to do so when it needs to yield execution because it can't do anything else then it returns uh, uh, something called pending and then when it does that then the executor tries checks with the next task and so on uh, and this is this is uh, very similar to any like scheduling system but um, it uh, you can do so with these tasks which are declared asynchronously which means they can uh, be written in this async uh, syntax so what happens when you have have interrupts for instance is uh, in, in for instance is that um, your task might say that i'm going to wait for this interrupt now and then it when the executor pulls it it says oh i don't have anything else to do i just need waiting for this interrupt and when the interrupt occurs then the interrupt handler will sort of set some state in the peripheral saying that ah you should uh, you should you're you're done with your operation now and then it tells the executor that and then that again checks with the task do you have can you make progress and then yes the task can make progress so uh that's very simplified how this works it's a very complex topic as well but i just wanted to oops i wanted to um uh, cover it uh quickly so let's take a look at how this um looks in uh Rest. Um, now, in addition to this uh, hardware 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 abstraction layer, uh, we have a runtime uh, dependency, uh, and we'll see how our application is structured again now. Uh, and see, now it's a lot simpler again. You have. Uh, still a main function this time it's a different type signature it has an async keyword it has uh, some arguments for, for instance uh, the peripherals uh, of your microcontroller which you can access this way so you don't need to call this init function manually uh, and it has a spawner which allows you to create uh, spawn new tasks uh, and you set up your you create your peripherals the same way so before uh, and the main loop is almost identical to the the first busy looping one except for one minor detail uh, which is that before checking the button state is actually waiting for any event on the button to occur and in this case that means an interrupt uh, and it's using the uh, await keyword for that what this does is is saying that uh, this task that is running here is just saying to the executor when it's calling await, it's saying, uh, I'm waiting for a button interrupt. Uh, I can't do anything else right now. And then the executor will sort of put the whole system to sleep until it receives this event and then wake the tasks again. And then it will continue and check if the button has changed state or not. Uh, so this, um, yeah, so this uh, is clearly very readable uh, compared to this uh, interrupt version um, and um, let's see if it runs okay it does and the great thing with this is, is that this is just as low power as the interrupt version it just has uh, a minor uh, overhead of uh, switching the tasks but uh, you can write, uh, you know, low power uh, interrupt driven code in a very uh, similar way as you would uh, with write blocking code. So let's go to the next step, which is um, actors. Um, I need to lead up a bit. Uh, so the actors uh, is. Um, something used in web frameworks and uh, you know people are familiar with ACA which is uh, a framework for composing actors and by actors are really async tasks 
that receive uh, some uh, uh, messages in their inbox. They check this and then they uh, uh, act on that state. And um, that's what Rogue Device is about. Uh, so let's look at how this looks for uh, that. Uh, so with actors, you're still using the embassy runtime, uh, but now you're creating actors called LEDs and uh, buttons, and then you're sort of mounting them into the runtime. And um, why I'm showing is this, this is that uh, if you look at the, um, the previous example, the async version, then, then you have to sort of say that this is, uh, I'm checking the button for being in a low state, and then I'm setting the lead to be high. And then if instead the system knew what that meant, like if this button does something, then this lead should, should do something, then that can be uh, modeled as actors, where you have a button actor that emits this event to an LED actor, and then the LED actor knows what to do. So that's what we're doing here. We're not defining any behavior uh, in our application. We're just wiring things together. Uh, it's a bit it's a bit more complex side type signatures because <clears throat> actors need to be global, you know, because uh, they 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 keep some state and need to be able to uh, run uh, uh, the processing loop uh, for for forever. So this. You have this if you're. It's the same as spawning a, a task in Embassy, and instead this task is a is a task plus a uh, in a message queue, basically. Um, okay, that's uh, actors. We can uh, talk more about that later if we have time. So enough with the uh, blinking. Uh, Let's try and um, and uh, see if we can do something uh, more complex. Uh, so in this case, uh, our real application is uh, is uh, using this board, sending some data, uh, re recording some temperature data using the temperature sensor, and then sending that to the to the cloud. Um, so first, uh, let's take a look at the temperature application. Um, look at the manifest. We now have a, a dependency in addition here that's depending on drogue device. And so this is the drug IoT project for the firmware. And then our main application is basically um, a bit more, more of the same, really, but uh, it, instead of just a button and a LED, it's an I2C bus where you declare uh, which pins it's supposed to use on the board. Uh, it's actually using DMA, which is uh, a really beauty of uh, async Rust, is that you can do DMA like it was just regular code. Um, because the, when a DMA operation is completed, then you sort of, you can program can continue. So it's a good fit for that. Uh, we have the, uh, some pins related to the sensor we're using. Uh, the temperature sensor. And then uh, you have these uh, actors in the system. So I'm using actors. There's one actor for the I2C bus. This is allow using an actor for it allows you to share it between different parts of your application because it will ensure that only one uh, one request is being handled by the, the peripheral at a time. So ac actors are great for uh, sharing state. Uh, and then there's uh, the sensor itself. We're using a temperature driver that's part of drug device. And our application, which is our own actor, which we'll take a look at. Uh, so the sensor will use the uh, I2C actor to read the data. Then, the, uh, then there's a button actor, which when pressed will invoke the application, which will then ask the sensor for the data. Um, So I'll, I'll skip the uh, looking at the actor itself uh, because we don't really have time for it. Um, 
or it can do uh no we'll try and run it okay so i'm just pressing the button here and it's seems to be quite hot in my room <laughs> uh yeah that's it uh, but you'll notice that the, the program I wrote didn't have much you know, logic, it's application logic. So let's go to the um, next, sorry. So now we want to report the temperature to, uh, to the cloud. This will be our last uh, example. So once I'm done with this, we can do some uh, Q and A. Um, I'll um, go to the terminal again, and we'll have a quick look at the application. Uh, so in a, it's um, building on this sensor application that I was just showing. In addition, now we're uh, adding some configuration of uh, the cloud endpoint, which is you know, first we need to connect to the Wi-Fi network uh, and the cloud endpoint we're going to use, the username and password uh, for uh, for accessing, and then there's some board support crates that help us uh, use the correct peripherals of our board. Um, so yeah, basically you uh, instantiate the board, you set up Wi-Fi, oops, and then um, you join the Wi-Fi network. Then you, you're basically setting up the actors of the system again. In a, the only additional actor now is the Wi-Fi actor. Uh, <clears throat> and the Wi-Fi actor is uh, passed on to the application, which will use it to send data. So now your application can work with any, net, any actor uh, that implements these uh, functionality of the of the Wi-Fi uh, and that's it the button is the is about the same and uh, in this case I'll um, I'll run a video of the demo because uh, I want to be sure that everything was working so now I'm uh, using the drogue IOT endpoint um, this is the console of drogue IOT uh, where you can uh, view messages entering the the system. And you run your application, then uh, it's joining the network um, on the board, and then um, we can press the button to send data, and then it appears in the in the cloud. Um, so you can, um, if you want to look more into the details of the, the application itself, it's all available online and uh, I'm open for questions uh, about it as well. Um, so let's go to slides. So some final notes, what have we seen, what have we learned? Um, so. If you're uh, if this piqued your interest in uh, REST embedded, uh, please join the community. There's uh, uh, some uh, cha uh, matrix.org chat channels that you can join. There's they are pretty active with people uh, doing all sorts of interesting projects, and uh, there's uh, even have a, like a weekly meeting that you can uh, join. Uh, some some uh, links to useful uh, resources for learning uh, embedded rust there's a book in the um, uh, rust embedded organization uh, which explains a lot of these uh, things uh, more basically and in more detail than i've done today uh, there's a few useful frameworks like the arctic that i mentioned and the embassy which uh, i'm also working on and the drogue iot project itself uh, which is like this cloud endpoint and as well as the device stuff. Um.